All right. So we were talking last time about uh, pharmaceutical companies and the tale of the nefarious or not so nefarious chiral switch. This is where drug companies will market and sell a racemic mixture of enantiomers first. And then when their patent expires, they'll decide, hey, we actually now have a process for making the pure enantiomer that's active and we think you should buy that exclusively from us and, and that's a way to extend their patent lifetime. Uh, and we were discussing whether or not this would be a good idea. And it turns out you can't really tell. It's a case by case basis. Uh, and, and the reason you, you have to be worried about it is because biology is chiral. So I want to demonstrate to you that two enantiomers might bind the same protein differently. Uh, I, the example that I found for which structure was available was, uh, was a small inhibitor of a bacterial enzyme and its structure isn't important uh, for us, but just to see that the way they bind to the same protein is different is the point I want to make. So, the inhibitor structure is shown in orange for the S enantiomer and purple for the R enantiomer. In the background is uh, the protein with the protein backbone shown as a cartoon and side chains shown as sticks. Uh, for the protein gray, atoms represent carbon, blue is nitrogen, red is oxygen, yellow is sulfur. This weird gold color is bromine. Uh, and for the inhibitor, orange is carbon or purple is carbon, depending on the enantiomer. The little red dots are water molecules. These are from crystal structures where you actually take the protein, put in the inhibitor, grow a crystal, and then shoot x-rays at it. And the x-rays diffract, and then you can do some math to calculate what the structure is. Um, so we can actually overlay both of these images to demonstrate how differently these molecules bind to the protein. The stereo center uh, is right here. Uh, and you can see that in both cases, there is a nitrogen on a six-membered ring that likes to hydrogen bond with uh, what looks like a negatively charged carboxylate group. But once you position that nitrogen there, everything else about the molecule follows. For the R enantiomer, the rest of the molecule juts out to the right. And for the S enantiomer, the rest of the molecule juts out to the left. Notice that by coming out here to the left, our inhibitor gains the ability to form hydrogen bonds between its carboxylate group and a water molecule in the active site and some other side chain nitrogens in the active site. So those two enantiomers experience the protein totally differently. Uh, we can overlay both of those images and you can see how different it really is. Uh, it's as different as right-handed versus left-handed. We talked extensively last time about how a right handshake with another right hand is a diastereomer of a right handshake with a left hand, right? Even though the inhibitor and the protein are not covalently attached together, they are bound with some amount of free energy, and we can call this a non-covalent complex. between protein and inhibitor. And the protein inhibitor complex on the left is a diastereomer of the protein inhibitor complex on the right. And we'll say it's the S inhibitor versus the versus the R inhibitor. The protein is the same in both slides. The stereocenters in the protein are all the same. The difference is the one stereocenter in the inhibitor. If you're the same at 
if you're different at one, but not all stereo centers, your diastereomers. So these two complexes are diastereomers of each other, and therefore they have different properties, including biological function. So, um, for example, one of these inhibitors binds better than the other. They did a bind, the authors of the study did a binding experiment. They demonstrated that one bound better than the other and would therefore be a better inhibitor. Uh, similarly, in other contexts, you might expect one enantiomer to maybe bind to a receptor and the other to not bind at all. Or maybe both bind the receptor, but one activates the receptor, whereas the other suppresses it. Uh, or maybe they both have similar effects, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on the structure of the molecule and its enantiomer and the structure of the protein that it's interacting with. So it can be quite complicated. Nevertheless, this racemate versus pure enantiomer chiral switch is something that comes up all the time with uh, drugs. Uh, for example, uh, there's a drug called bupropion, which I think was originally prescribed for smoking cessation, but also has antidepressive sort of effects. It's one of the meds I'm on. I'll tell you another story another time, but yay, yay depression meds. They make life better. Um, in any case, that is sold as a racemate. Uh, and, and there have not been any attempts to sell the pure enantiomer because apparently it doesn't make any difference, all right? So we talked last time about how you would not be surprised if, or even impressed, if a sales rep told you, hey, 50 milligrams of the pure stuff is just as good as 100 milligrams of the one-to-one -one mixture. That's just another way of saying that 100 milligrams of the one-to-one -one mixture has 50 milligrams of the active enantiomer in a situation where, say, the A isomer was active and the B isomer wasn't. Uh, presumably, the A, the, uh, the neither enantiomer is toxic because presumably they did the clinical trials with the racemate and looked for toxicity and so they didn't observe anything. So uh, going to just the pure enantiomer shouldn't be a problem. But the question is, does it have a benefit? And in the case of this anti-heartburn drug, um, probably not. Uh, the one benefit was that some people have a mutation in a particular cytochrome P450 enzyme that makes it easier to metabolize one of these versus the other. And so depending on what gene you have, you may it may be better to take the one enantiomer versus the racemate. But it's a subtle difference. And so actually the chiral switch probably failed. To this day, you can go to Costco and you can buy omeprazole or it's pure enantiomer S omeprazole. And the price is about the same because demand for both of them is about the same because they do the same thing and there's not a real benefit for one versus the other. All right. Anything more we need to say about that? I guess the one other situation to worry about um, is the situation where you might try to administer a pure enantiomer, but uh, under biological conditions, that pure enantiomer might equilibrate with its uh, other form. Uh, the classic story here is the one I alluded to last time of thalidomide. So here's the stereo center of thalidomide, which is, as I, as I, as many of you know, an anti-nausea, anti-emetic drug uh, has been prescribed for morning sickness in pregnancy. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, an antiomer is a teratogen, so you take the same structure and you switch the stereochemistry and you see a dramatic change in function. And uh, lots of research has been done on this. I don't know what structural issues uh, are related to these dramatic differences in effects. 
But you might say, okay, well, easy. Let's just administer this pure enantiomer. We won't use the racemic mixture. But it gets trickier than that, and that is because uh, this proton at the stereocenter is somewhat acidic. Now, it doesn't appear to be acidic now. You'll learn that it's acidic in 352. It's adjacent to a carbonyl, and you can imagine if you drew the conjugate base, that negative charge would be, oops, didn't want to paste the image, paste that. The negative charge in the conjugate base would be stabilized by resonance. Uh, and if it were stabilized by resonance, that would mean that the carbon that held the negative charge in the conjugate base should be sp2 hybridized so that it can participate in resonance. But the problem with sp2 hybridization is that it's trigonal planar and it's no longer a stereocenter. So what they think happened with thalidomide is that some biological base, not sure what it was, would remove that proton. You would get the conjugate base, which was flat at, that at, at what used to be a stereocenter, and it could be protonated from either side. If, it added, if the proton were added from the bottom, you would get the teratogen. If it were added from the top, you would get back the anti-emetic drug. And so you would quickly convert one pure enantiomer into a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers, and you, no matter what, would still have some of the toxic compound around. So that's something that uh, the drug developers have to be aware of. If you have a stereocenter in your molecule, how likely is it to be uh, damaged by the biological conditions that you put it in. Uh, the process of converting a stereocenter that used to be pure into a mixture of configurations at that stereocenter has a name. It's called epimerization, and you can forget that name until I mention it again, which will be maybe never in 351. So I don't know why we... Oh, we did it. Any questions? Okay. So just think of that at some point in the future when you're prescribing drugs and think sensibly about uh, enantiomers and racemic mixtures and make sure you ask the right questions of the pharmaceutical pill pushers. Um, all right. So uh, there's... One other thing I wanted to talk about for stereochemistry, I struggle with this one because I don't do a very good job of explaining it. The study guide and the text take you through it. Um, I tend to make it way too mathy and confuse people. Last, last time I spent, uh, in the noon lecture, I spent too much time on this and I regretted it immediately afterwards. But I'm afraid if I don't, you're going to encounter problems like this on standardized exams in your future, perhaps MCAT and DAT, and they do want you to know how to approach them. Uh, I will say if I make it too complicated, it's not as complicated as you think. So I've shown you this horrible structure of a molecule called quinine. It's an anti-malarial drug, and uh, it is chiral. It's got uh, some stereocenters. For example, this is a stereocenter. Uh, this is a stereocenter, and actually probably this nitrogen's a stereocenter too, but we'll just ignore it. Uh, and then this is a stereocenter, as is that. You get them all? Basically. Um, molecules that are chiral have an interesting property, that is they can rotate plain polarized light. So many of you have had experience with polarized sunglasses. You wear them to get rid of glare. If you've been to a 3D movie, uh, in many cases, the glasses they give you have polarized lenses, one polarized in one direction and the other polarized in this direction. Um, I made the mistake of going to see The Last Jedi in 3D a couple of years ago, and uh, 
because polarization eliminates some of the light coming to your eyes, the screen was actually quite dim. I didn't even know that Admiral Holdo had purple hair because you couldn't tell differences between colors. Uh, in any case, if you ever tried to take two polarization uh, lenses and hold them at 90 degrees to each other and it blocks out some of the light, a polarizing filter takes all the photons that are passing through it and it weeds out any that are not oscillating in the, in the same direction. Where, uh, so a photon is, uh, we can think of light as a wave uh, that is oscillating in uh, an electric field and a magnetic field. Uh, so when light is polarized, its EM field is oscillating all in the same direction. Each photon, say the electric field is oscillating up or down, but not side to side. So that's polarized light. Uh, and you can make polarized light by passing light through a polarizing filter, and I'm not sure how they work. But then if you take that polarized light and you pass it through a chiral sample, say a solution of chiral molecules, uh, it turns out that once the light gets out of the sample, you observe that uh, it has rotated. Um, and you can actually measure the angle of rotation from where it used to be to where the plane of polarization is now. You can measure that angle with an instrument called a polarimeter and that angle of rotation is called alpha or optical rotation. Um, so it turns out you can use this alpha number as a way to analyze which enantiomer of a substance you have and how much of the pure substance you have. Uh, so the optical rotation for a pure sample of quinine is plus 165. Um, I will point out that plus is either clockwise or counterclockwise, I forget, but you've got plus rotation and minus rotation. There is no correlation whatsoever between a stereo center being R or S and whether that molecule rotates right-handed or left-handed, clockwise or counterclockwise. There's no correlation whatsoever. And in terms of the physics that explain how this happens, uh, we're just going to put physics with an exclamation point and we're going to leave it at that. So uh, the alpha value is how much the polarization plane has changed after it goes through the sample. <clears throat> All right. Question so far about what you need to know versus what not to care about. So suppose I had a sample that was a mixture of quinine and its enantiomer, which I'm going to call enantioquinine. Enantiomers rotate light to the same extent, but in opposite directions. So enantioquinine's optical rotation would be negative 165 degrees. The other interesting thing is that the optical rotation is additive. So if I have a solution that is 50% quinine plus 50% enantioquinine, the observed rotation is zero. How does that happen? Well, the 50% of the mixture that is quinine will rotate uh, Let's back up. I said rotation is additive, and I also said I, I should have said it is related to concentration. So in other words, if I have a sample that's twice as concentrated as another sample, it will rotate. If I have two solutions of quinine, one is one molar and the other is two molar, the two molar solution is going to rotate by twice as much as the one molar solution. 
So because of that, if you have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, what this does for you is uh, the quinine, which is 50% of the total, rotates by 165 degrees times 50%. The enantioquinine rotates by minus 165 degrees times 50%. And then overall, you add that all together and the observed rotation is zero. They cancel each other out, okay? So this is true of all one-to-one -one mixtures of enantiomers. They cancel each other out and they don't rotate light. And sometimes people will use an old term for racemic mixtures. They will talk about a mixture being optically inactive, which is an old term that we don't use anymore, but you might occasionally hear it. So, if a mixture does rotate light, you automatically know something about, uh, about that mixture. So suppose we observe that the rotation is 82.5 degrees plus 82.5 degrees. Already, based on the sign of the rotation, I know that quinine is the major enantiomer. All right. However, the extent of rotation is smaller than I expect for pure quinine. So, uh, and, and George at home is asking, uh, yes, tabulated alpha values are at a standard concentration, otherwise you can't compare them. Uh, and Levi, you mentioned that if we had a greater concentration of quinine than enantioquinine, then the angle would have to be greater than zero degrees, yes. Um, so by observing the sign of this rotation in our unknown mixture, plus it being positive, then we know because quinine rotates by plus 165 that quinine must be the major enantiomer. Now, the observed rotation divided by the expected alpha for the pure enantiomer here is 82.5 divided by 165. I chose the numbers deliberately so that I can do the math and that equals 50%. So this mixture only rotates 50% as much as is expected. There's only two ways for that to happen. First, it could be the pure enantiomer, but only be 50% as concentrated as I, as I expect. So maybe I made that mistake. Or it could be a mixture of enantiomers. 50% of the mixture is one is the pure enantiomer, and the other 50% is one-to-one -one mixture. Remember how I said that one-to-one -one mixtures are optically inactive? If I have a solution that is 75% quinine and 25% enantioquinine, then 25% enantioquinine cancels out 25% of regular quinine, and that becomes your one-to-one -one optically inactive rotation equals zero. And then the remaining 50% of quinine is what can rotate, and that's what gives us the 82 and a half degrees of rotation, okay? That's the qualitative way of going through it that is as not mathy as possible. Uh, there are a couple other ways to do this. Um, and if you want, I can show you. Uh, Sierra, you're asking, do we know that quinine is the major enantiomer because I told you? Not only that, but because of the sign of the observed rotation in our unknown mixture compared to the sign of the expected rotation for the pure major for the pure quinine. 
right? Other questions? So I don't want to beat uh, this too hard given that it's uh, not crazy important. Organic chemists use this. Oh, uh, and Kate is asking, how do we know the rotation is positive 15 and not negative 375? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. No idea. Um, organic chemists use this when they're making chiral molecules to demonstrate how pure their sample is, whether it's a pure enantiomer or a mixture of that molecule with its other enantiomer. Um, all right, so the other way to do this is to define percent enantiomeric excess. And this equals the observed rotation over the um, rotation for the pure major for uh, the pure enantiomer. And this number is always positive because you always match the sign uh, uh, of the number on top with the number on the bottom. That's enantiomeric excess. And if we let y equal, uh, or sorry, if we let x equal the concentration of quinine and y equal the concentration of enantioquinine, and, and actually in terms of concentration, I guess we should say percent quinine versus percent enantioquinine, uh, this number should be x minus y or y minus x depending on what the major enantiomer is and then because you know that the mixture contains only quinine or its enantiomer you now have two equations and two unknowns and you can solve for x and y so that's the other math way to do it i don't care how you choose to think about it whether you calculate enantiomeric excess and then say, whatever that enantiomeric excess is, the remaining percent of what's in solution is a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers and calculate it that way. Either way is fine. All right, and yeah, the, the expected value for quinine was just determined experimentally. Uh, it's from your book. All right, other, other questions? I'm sort of bored to tears explaining it to you, uh, but, but questions do come up, uh, and so I just want you to be prepared to deal with them. All right, anything else? So um, now we're going to jump into reactions. Chapter 6 is going to focus on wh why reactions happen and how they happen. And then we'll do specific examples for the rest of the semester. So the why behind why reactions happen is really based in this idea of thermodynamics, which uh, tells you, are, uh, lets you sort of ask, are the products more or less stable than the reactants. Uh, and in thermodynamics, we're worried about equilibrium constant, changes in free energy, changes in enthalpy, changes in entropy. The how uh, is an issue of kinetics and mechanism. Um, what changes first? Which bond is formed or broken first? Then what happens? Does it all happen at once? Or is one before the other? Are there any intermediates? If so, how long do they last? And both of these issues are gonna be important uh, for understanding not only the reactions we'll talk about, but also understanding uh, biochemistry. So uh, it may be worth just a little bit of review from Gen Chem. I, it will seem boring and uh, that's okay. The principles are important. Uh, you remember the relationship between free energy and equilibrium constant. Uh, 
That is, if equilibrium constant is greater than one, meaning products are favored, free energy's gotta be negative, right? Negative free energy means you're going to more stable products versus starting materials. We also have this definition of free energy as being change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy. And I don't, uh, I can remember not understanding or not even knowing what on earth enthalpy meant, not only in general chemistry, but also uh, in organic chemistry. Frankly, I didn't really even know what it meant when I first started to teach this class back in 2011. I understand it a little better now. And uh, it's actually useful to, to have a sense for what it is. You can think of enthalpy as being related to the strength of the bonds you form versus the bonds you break. Um, and uh, we could add to the term bonds we could expand that to include both covalent bonds and non-covalent interactions. For the rest of OCHEM, uh, we'll be focusing on covalent bonds, but you can apply what we'll talk about to the concept of non-covalent interactions. Is a hydrogen bond stronger after some process than it was before? Um, Delta S is change in entropy. And entropy is another word for disorder. Uh, and there are other statistical definitions of entropy. But uh, the real question is, are the products you form more or less organized than the starting materials? And our general assumption is going to be that uh, at the temperatures we're interested in, uh, the change in entropy is going to be small and ignorable or negligible, I guess. Um, and that assumption will work, though it's not universally true. And so I can't think of questions I might ask that where the, where the outcome would depend on you finding the situations where this assumption isn't true. But I want you to be aware of the limitations to this assumption. First, when you go from one product to two or more, or go from two starting materials to one, uh, the change in entropy can be sizable, either positive or negative. Going from one product to two, that's an increase in degrees of freedom. Two things can move around instead of one thing. Uh, so you'd expect delta S to be positive there. Uh, two things becoming one, you might expect delta S to be negative because you're reducing the degrees of freedom. Uh, another case is when one of your products is a gas like uh, CO2 or N2. Gases have a, a much higher entropy than liquids uh, or solids. And therefore, if one of your products is a gas, likely the entropy is, the change in entropy is huge and positive. Often molecules that evolve, uh, or rather reactions that evolve a gas are very downhill in energy and essentially irreversible because of the huge amount of entropy you gain. And then the last situation is when you make a ring or open a ring, uh, the change in entropy can, can also be large in that case. If you take a long chain uh, and constrain it to be in a six or a five or a four membered ring, that can have a, a, a large decrease in entropy. If on the other hand, you take like a three membered ring and pop it open, everything has more freedom and entropy will uh, increase dramatically. So I, I, these are not decision points on some huge decision tree that you might try to draw for yourself to answer, to see if you can answer a question correctly, but they describe situations where our assumption might not be good.
So with that in mind, for a given reaction, can we use what we, can we use what we know to predict whether the reaction will be favorable or not? Um, in order to do this, we need to introduce something called bond dissociation enthalpy. Uh, these are tabulated values. Some of them are in tables in your text in chapter six. Others are in appendix A. And this is the change in enthalpy for the reaction where you take a molecule, you take a bond uh, and you break it apart in, in a homolytic fashion. That is, each partner in that bond gets one of the two electrons in the bond and they are separated at infinite distance. And that's the bond dissociation enthalpy. If you measure delta H for this reaction, uh, it would be 105 basically kilocalories per mole. Your text may use kilojoules per mole. There's about four kilojoules to a kilocalorie. Either unit is acceptable. Um, this difference in energy is basically what we were talking about back when we were saying that when you mix two 1s orbitals together to get a sigma bonding orbital and a sigma star antibonding orbital and the two electrons from hydrogen go into that bonding orbital, this energy difference here is basically the bond dissociation enthalpy or 105 kilocalories per mole. That's how much energy it takes to promote these electrons back up to the non-bonding orbitals they were in. Yeah? For enthalpy, we've always kind of learned that it was associated with heat. And so is the correct way to think about it, like, it's the heat in the bond? So okay. enthalpy, you can measure uh, changes in enthalpy for a reaction by watching how the temperature of the reaction changes. Uh, and if you were to go in the opposite direction, take these two hydrogens and link them together, that is the amount of heat that would be released. Yeah. Um, processes that have uh, positive enthalpies, that means you would have to absorb heat or energy to break the bond, right? And processes where enthalpy is positive are called endothermic. Uh, and you may have uh, encountered endothermic processes before uh, in the lab, for example, if you mix uh, some organic solvents with water, like acetonitrile in water, it gets cold because the heat of mixing is endothermic. There are other processes where delta H is negative and those are called exothermic. And exothermic reactions are behind those little pouches that you put in your gloves when you're skiing on a cold day to keep your hands warm. It's an exothermic reaction that's going. Somehow you're forming new, <coughs> new bonds that are more stable than the bonds you're breaking and that energy is released in the form of heat. Um, all right, you okay so far? So let's use the numbers to make a prediction for a reaction. And I haven't chosen, I guess, a very simple example um, because in order to get this one right, we really need not only information about the bonds, but also information about the negatively charged molecules on either side of the equation. I'm showing you uh, an elimination reaction. We start out with this alkyl halide and a strong base. And we get uh, the base removes a proton. Uh, we form a pi bond between the two carbons and uh, bromine leaves with its electrons so that we make, uh, of the bonds that we make, we make this new carbon-carbon pi bond, we make this new oxygen-hydrogen uh, 
sigma bond and of the bonds that we break, we break a carbon hydrogen sigma bond and a carbon bromine sigma bond. <clears throat> so let's deal with that first. Let's uh, think about the bonds that we broke. Okay, how much energy does it take to break a carbon hydrogen sigma bond, especially if the carbon is sp3 hybridized? And you can look up the bond dissociation enthalpy in kilocalories per mole in your text or in uh, the table. And I'm going to just use a rule of thumb value. Uh, you may find a more accurate number, but to facilitate the discussion, plus 90 degrees. Breaking bonds is always positive. It always requires energy to break bonds. Uh, similarly, you could look up a carbon bromine uh, sigma bond between an sp3 hybridized carbon and bromine and you would find that that bond is actually quite a bit weaker than a carbon hydrogen bond we've talked maybe about why that's the case it has to do with the fact that carbon and hydrogen are closer in energy than carbon and bromine also has to do with the fact that bromine is bigger and the carbon bromine bond is longer than the carbon hydrogen <coughs> bond but in any case those are the two bonds that we break now, if we come and we reflect on the bond dissociation enthalpies of the bonds that we make, let's see, we make a new oxygen-hydrogen bond, and that uh, tends to be around 100 kilocalories per mole. And then we make a carbon-carbon pi bond now, how much is a pi bond worth? It turns out that uh, in the tables that you have in your book, they will show you bond dissociation enthalpies for double bonds. But when they do that, what they're really doing is they're showing you the amount of energy it would take to break both the sigma and the pi. So if you take this number and you subtract from it the strength of a carbon-carbon sigma bond, you can estimate the strength of a carbon-carbon pi bond. And for uh, our purposes today, that number tends to be around 70 kilocalories per mole. Um, I'm rounding and just trying to use numbers that are easy to write. Uh, the actual numbers will be different. Okay, so to compare the overall change in enthalpy for this reaction or to estimate it, we're going to take the sum of the bond dissociation enthalpies for the bonds that we break bond dissociation enthalpy of bonds broken we're going to add them up so we'll use the capital sigma for adding a sum and then we're going to subtract the sum of the bond dissociation enthalpies for the bonds that we form why do we subtract? Because forming bonds releases energy, but bond dissociation enthalpies are all calculated for breaking the bond. All right, so let's do the sums and then we can do the subtraction. 90 and 60 is 150. 170 over here. So 150 minus 170 is negative 20 kilocalories per mole. So we expect this to be downhill in energy, exothermic. Now, the one thing we haven't considered that isn't captured by bond dissociation enthalpy is the stability of these negatively charged groups. We haven't dealt with that at all. And so actually, the, our observed, uh, our estimate for delta H might be kind of off because we haven't uh, accounted for that. But we do have a way of thinking about whether Br minus is more stable than uh, the negatively charged oxygen. And that way is simply pKa, which we did in chapter two. The pKa of the conjugate acid of HBr is like minus nine, uh, which indicates that Br itself on its own is very stable. 
the pKa for the conjugate acid of this alkoxide is uh, actually, you would think it would be around uh, 16. It's actually a little bit higher, 19, for reasons that don't matter to our discussion. But basically, Br minus uh, is um, 10 to the 28 times more, well, Br minus is way more stable than the negatively charged molecule. So probably this uh, reaction is downhill in energy even more. I wouldn't require you to put a number on it, but it's, it's useful when you have negatively charged things on either side of the equation to, to use your pKa uh, knowledge and intuition to add some context to what you're doing. All right, questions about this? Thermodynamics does not care at all about how the reaction happens. It just cares about what the starting state is and what the ending state is, okay? No matter how you get there. Okay, um, there's some good questions about whether bond dissociation enthalpy has to do with one electron or does it refer to two? Uh, the bond dissociation enthalpies refer to the process of breaking a bond into two equal parts. And so yes, both electrons are involved. Um, all right, let's see. Um, so in general, when we, when we say a reaction is favorable, it will be because uh, the bonds that we form are more stable than the bonds that we break. Um, this actually allows us to say something about um, something you may have heard before in a biology class. Um, you've heard of the molecule ATP, right? Maybe. And you may have heard someone tell you, breaking one of these bonds in ATP releases energy. Have you heard those words before? Okay. You have been taught that by someone who did not understand the complete picture. No offense, but it's not strictly true. Because as we've just pointed out, breaking bonds always requires energy, not the other way around. So this is ATP. And a classic reaction in ATP, or of ATP, is to uh, transfer one of these phosphate groups onto some other oxygen. For example, the first step in glycolysis involves transfer of that phosphate group onto this OH group of glucose. Uh, we, and uh, I don't think I probably have the time to draw you both of the products, but I will try anyway. <laughs> um, the bond that you're breaking in going uh, from ATP to ADP is this bond right here. That's called a phosphoanhydride bond, but breaking a bond never, ever, 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 ever releases energy. However, breaking a bond and replacing it with a more stable bond can release energy. All right, so the first step in glycolysis replaces a phosphoanhydride bond with a more stable phosphoester bond. This bond is more stable. This bond is less. Apple pencil battery is low, less stable. So overall, it's downhill in energy. 
it's not that ATP randomly flies apart and there's a big explosion and fire and energy is released. No, it's that the bonds you form are more stable than the bonds you broke, okay? So please, please end that wicked tradition of your fathers and transfer to your children and their children and their children's children that breaking bonds does not release energy and, and we'll all be better off as a nation <laughs> and as a world. I, I, need some, I need some background music, perhaps Battle Hymn of the Republic as I get on my soup, soap box. Soup box, that's not a thing. All right, we'll see you next time. <laughs>